All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back. Um, we will have a slightly different format now for the first two sessions uh, this morning. Um, the purpose of which is to workshop papers uh, which have been pre-circulated. I uh, hope you had a chance to read them because the purpose really is to talk about the papers rather than present them again. So we're working on the assumption that, uh, that people uh, know the papers. And even so, we'll give a brief chance to each of the uh, authors to say a few words about the scope and purpose and uh, final destinations of, of, of these papers. So to situate them, them better uh, for, for comments. All right, I, uh, I, I won't say much on the authors, so not to cannibalize uh, your time. We only have 30 minutes per paper. I suggest we do them one after the other so that every paper gets its uh, due share of time. Uh, and uh, I guess we can uh, continue in the order in which they appear on the program. So start with uh, Thomas Gidney, who uh, has finished his PhD here at the Institute. Um, and uh, with a thesis about uh, British colonies as, or, or colonies, areas of influence uh, as members of the, of the League of Nations, uh, including Egypt, which was the example in the paper. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for that opening statement. And thank you so much for inviting me here today and for all the work that's gone into preparing the, the conference. Um, so just to get right into the small introduction, um, in case you didn't get to read all of it. So this story is about Egypt's attempt, and which it finally manages to successfully do in 1937, to become a full member state of the League of Nations. Now this comes out of my uh, thesis, where I sort of examine India, Ireland, and Egypt, and their attempts to become member states of the League of Nations, um, whilst also being British colonies, or dominions, or some, under some form of British colonial uh, rule. Um, but I thought that today I would present Egypt as a sort of standalone case, not necessarily to bring out the single nationalist narrative of Egypt's um, ability to enter the League of Nations. Um, I think that Egypt offers many interesting examples in history of somewhere that had huge implications on the rest of the world. It was really the linchpin of the British Empire, which is what um, led to Britain's recalcitrance in, in uh, granting it uh, membership of the League to some extent uh, and was a huge linchpin within a large imperial network in, um, and essentially Britain's empire in Asia. Um, now we often know this through the Suez Canal, so this is all very well known, but what, another aspect that I wanted to look at which was very important in the negotiations about Egypt's entry into the League was also the control of the Nile and the access into Britain's empire in Africa. Um, so Egypt was a place of sort of great hydrological and colonial significance. But I also think that despite the fact that we also know quite a lot about history, uh, Egypt's history of decolonization uh, from the Egyptian revolution until uh, Nasser's successful nationalization of the Suez Canal, the role of the League um, is again extremely underlooked, um, understudied and has very little published on it. Uh, but I believe it played a very central and symbolic role in the negotiations that led to, uh, to Egypt signing the 1936 Anglo-Egyptian Treaty. Um, and I think, ultimately, the audience for this paper um, is probably going to be closer to history, um, someone interested in the history of decolonization, more than this being a League history. The League is important in the sense that it's a sort of site in which British colonial politics is being worked on. It's not the principal instigator of this change. It's a, it's a tool within sort of Britain's box set, imperial box set, but it's not the organization necessarily uh, dabbling in global governance in the same sort of way the mandates might have done. All right, thank you. All right, thanks so much, Thomas, for this uh, very succinct and efficient introduction. So I open the floor to comments. All right, okay, Emmanuel. Yeah. I, microphone. Yeah. I, I was just wondering whether there was a. <coughs> so I, I, I just wanted to ask you whether, because I didn't see any reference to Ireland, and I think 
um, you, you, you kept comparing Egypt and Iraq, and I think it's very relevant, but at the same time, I think you could make, you know, a trans-Mediterranean somehow, or even a Atlantic point, something, uh, comparison with Ireland, and the status of Ireland after the anglo Irish Treaty, and then the accession of Ireland to the League, and kind of it was not a fiction, but you know, Ireland was in a situation that was not totally independent, although the past was independent. And how it succeeded to the league was very different from Egypt, if I understand. So I, I'm wondering whether the case came up in the document, whether Egyptian representatives were, were also taking into account or using it as a, a case. Uh, so to whether you can elaborate on that. All right. Uh, thank you for the question. Can, can you repeat um, the question, Tom? Uh, yeah, the so role of Ireland. Yeah. Yeah. So Emmanuel was asking what. The, uh, so Ireland joined the League of Nations in 1923 or four, um, and he, uh, he's asking what the role of Ireland's accession was on Egypt. So actually, in the PhD thesis, I actually do discuss the comparison with Ireland and Egypt. I'm not exactly. Sh maybe maybe that was a, a negative point about me removing that comparison in in the Egyptian paper. But you're absolutely right that the negotiations for Ireland becoming the free state, essentially a British dominion, happens simultaneously with the negotiations that Britain has with the WAFT um, in Egypt. And the two definitely play off each other. Now I argue, so in the thesis I argue that the British, in the negotiations with the Irish, use the League as a sort of compliance mechanism. They uh, actively want Ireland to join the League of Nations um, and want them to sort of fully embrace sort of dominion status in the way it's been defined by Canada and South Africa and other dominions. Um, but they only want the Irish to do this once they have established a constitution um, which is acceptable by the terms of the Anglo-Irish Treaty. Um, before that, the British do not want the Irish to become a member of the League, fearing that they might use it as a sort of way to build better international recognition. Um, so it's, but in the case of Ireland, the Irish do sign the, the treaty, they sign a constitution that is then ratified by the British Parliament. So it's sort of deemed as the acceptable case. In Egypt this never happened, instead um, there's a sort of succession of governments coming and going, um, with the WAFT offering the sort of popular le legitimacy that the British ultimately realise they need to secure sort of a stable alliance with the Egyptians. So the two are very important. Ireland is sort of the case of how this sort of colonial politics was made more successful, at least for a few years, uh, then Valera comes in in the 1930s and sort of starts to change the Irish politics. But uh, Egypt would be the example of uh, this not going to uh, Britain's plan, I think. Alex, let's maybe collect a few comments because yeah. uh, uh, maybe the purpose is not only also to, to respond to the so, so, so that we know, but um, to, to collect a few ideas. About, uh, how to so, this. Thomas, this is sort of wearing my editorial cap, so not really knowing anything about this subject, but if I had received this as an editor, you know, the first question I would imagine a reader, if I sent it to a reader, would say is, okay, you seem to have the perspective from Whitehall and from Geneva, but what about from Cairo? In other words, you know, wherever you send this, I suspect a reader's going to say, well, yes, but why are all the sources in English? Why are the sources being generated from the British imperial side? What about the, uh, the Egyptian side? So again, it's not so much a criticism as an anticipation of what you might face uh, when you seek to publish this, if, if that's your intention. Nicola, I think you had your hand raised, and Sandrine next. Hi, Thomas. Um, I enjoyed this very much. It's fascinating stuff. I guess, in a sense, what I have to say follows on from Alex's point, really, is I, I, I think there's some decisions still to make about the focus of this paper and, and what significance you want to bring out. Because at the moment, there's several kinds of significance, I think, that I detected, sort of, you know, the story of Egypt's independence, the role of the League of Nations in relation to those kinds of stories, the wider significance of Egypt within the British Empire and the comparisons that arise. And I think it would be, I think you really need to decide on a single focus, and then at the end of the piece, bring out other ramifications or potential questions. And just sort of in relation to some of the things we were discussing in the uh, morning's panels, roundtables yesterday, um, you know, maybe sort of 
situate this a little more kind of theoretically in terms of the relationships between internationalism and the anti-colonial nationalism that you're, you're discussing here. Um, I mean, that might help in a sense. I mean, we were talking last night about why there are the Egyptian sources in, in the paper, but, um, you know, it, it might help to overcome that problem if you frame it rather differently as, as a story about internationalism and anti-colonial nationalism. Sandrine? Uh, yeah, this follows up exactly what Nicola was saying. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it exactly follows up what you were saying, Nicola. Um, uh, in fact, you know, I, I, I know nothing about Egypt, but I know a little bit about uh, India. And uh, so I was uh, wondering whether there was a connection, you know, between this country or the elites of this country and which kind of elites. Again, you know, I'm very careful about uh, the actors. I mean, who are the people there? Who are really the people in Egypt in particular? And that connects to what uh, uh, Alex was saying. And, uh, and if they have any contact to other you know, elites in other colonized countries, in particular in India, uh, and discussed the, the role that the league could play for an eventual decolonization. So is that something more than just, you know, the kind of negotiation with the British Empire and so on? So really, so it was my, would be my, my, my question to you, but I'm sure you know. Um, should I? Is that enough, or should we take more questions? Uh, I, I think, in, in the interest of time, we can pile on a bit more, and then at, at, at the very end, give you give you a chance to okay. to reflect on it. Uh, Jimmy. Uh, I really enjoyed reading this paper. So I was going to uh, add that uh, if you're going to publish this. Uh, there will also be a lot of interest in uh, people who work on the, uh, the Arab Asia group at the U United Nations, like Cindy Ewing. And uh, there, there's a question like, why wasn't there such groupings at the League of Nations, right? There were um, Asian and Arab countries that they form alliances. And Egypt, of course, is a missing piece um, at that point. So it could also, uh, there would be a lot of readers who were looking at this kind of lost uh, Asian um, Arab group, because I do know from uh, Palestinian struggles, they always look for representatives in, 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 uh, at the League. And at some point, they asked the Indian delegations to talk on their behalf against the Balfour Declaration. And I wondered why couldn't they ask you know, Arab members of the League uh, for the Palestinian delegation. But this seems like a, a missed opportunity. And the last one is that in terms of the legacy, I think there's uh, what comes next is Nasser, right? There is some sort of a weakening of the legitimacy and the performance and the power and prestige of the Egyptian monarchy. It is a very powerful, I mean, it, it become as a special province of the Ottomans. And I think your story also shows how Britain ended up weakening the Egyptian monarchy, uh, preparing the ground for Nasser, you know, in, albeit in, in unintentionally. So you may reflect on that too, uh, what this story tells about the post-war war to Egypt. Glenda? Thanks very much, Thomas, for I finally got to read some of your work. And um, now, and I always imagined it being much more about the League of Nations than about Egypt in a way. And uh, perhaps that's why I don't know the sources. But um, you know, so and and you know, to go to Nicole's point that yeah, you know, pick your theme. But if you are going to pursue the League theme, I mean, I thought it was interesting that the you know, extent to which this pay, plays into that debate about. You know, the, you know, is the League an extension of empire or not? But, and specifically with the you know, British imperial interests in the League. And we've always thought about it in terms of its imaginary, right? The, you know, that Britain somehow is the model of this League of Nations, you know, the, the British Empire and how it brings together different um, uh, countries is the model. But actually what's really interesting is the extent to which, you know, Egypt is part of a broader view of the empire as having one foreign policy, right? You know, because the Dominions don't have their own foreign policy yet, like Australia and New Zealand, well, even though they're independent. And so I feel like Egypt is also a really interesting dimension of, uh, of, of, a, of a history of the League where we're, you know, when we mention Egypt, we say, oh, you know, 
Even non-states get to be members, so there's that part of it. You know, what does that mean? And also, what do they get out of it? Like, I wanted to know, is there more than... Well, legitimacy is a lot, right? And obviously, it's clear that the League is a, another tool of state legitimation. But are there other practical things that think they're going to get out of it, like technical aid, even then, or... Because already the League is providing aid to, you know, parts of... Europe, for example. So is there a money aspect to it or just a sort of abstract legitimacy? So in terms of the League and what it is and how we think about it, you know, you know I was quite interested in hearing more about what you think what this Egyptian story tells us about that. If I can follow on with one uh, or two from this. So f first of all, I, I enjoyed the paper very much, learned a lot from it, uh, as I did from all the papers, by the way, which were uh, really great and, and entertaining and interesting. Um, so, so, so one of the things uh, that, that I thought about, uh, you, you may know this article by uh, David Armitage, The Contagion of Sovereignty, which was published in, in the South African Historical Journal, I think, but uh, is nonetheless widely read and, and, and cited, I think, which is, which is about the global spread of the American Declaration of Independence, right? And so uh, it, I, it, it, it's a very interesting piece, uh, in particular in framing this in this vocabulary of contagion, uh, and yet, w w one thing that, that happens there is that nationalism comes across as something very anemic, right? Yeah, it, it, it never becomes clear why they are so after these external trappings of statehood, right? And, 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 and something similar is, 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 is happening here, I think. I mean, uh, I, I don't know if the Egyptian case is particular in this, but, but the very term waft, of course, you know, as, as you may point out in the paper, uh, shows how important it is for them to be present in Paris, to, 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 to be seen, right? But um, when, when, as, as Glenda just said, uh, I, I, I'm always wondering, you know, why, why do they want this so badly? Uh, what, 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 is, what is in it for them? Uh, and and I, I was also interested in, in hearing a little bit more about uh, this from you. Um, because it's, of course, part of the story why the League, apparently, is, is, is for them so important, right? Uh, and, and the second thing about, about the focus, so, so at the moment, I, I had the feeling there's basically two, uh, two things that you uh, intend to, to explain. That was my impression. One, one is why the Egyptians want this so badly, or that the Egyptians want, or what, what's the role of the League for the Egyptians? The other one is, why do the British behave so differently in different cases, and why do the British block the, the Egyptian, right? And, and the explanation for the second question seems to be very, let's say, contingent uh, on, on what happens in 1924, and the question of Sudan, and the assassination of Stuck, and so forth. So, so, so in that part, I found it harder to see where the sort of larger lesson may lie beyond the specific case of why the British blocked Egypt's uh, uh, access. Uh, but, but, but maybe that just reflects my, you know, wh wh which, which part I, I, I found more interesting. Okay. Uh, well, I think I'll just Uh, so I'll start from the beginning with um, Alex's um, comments. Uh, so yes, regarding the sources, I absolutely agree that um, there were difficulties collecting sources uh, from Egypt. So most of my sources were collected from uh, British sources. I did collect some sources from um, India as well as some from France in the foreign archives there. Um, some of the British sources also contained the Cairo residencies papers too. But yes, you're right that there's a lack of papers from um, the WAF's perspective. This is partially due to the fact I didn't actually get to go to Egypt for this project. Um, part of the reason was that the uh, library I needed to go to was uh, blown up a few years ago in a suicide bombing. Um, and they have been trying to repair the archives and the library there. Um, they were supposed to reopen, I think, in 2020, and then uh, you know what happens. So. Um, yeah, so there, there is, I think, an important source of uh, 
um, element missing there. I do come across WAF letters quite often in private papers and other places too, so it's not like they're completely absent either. Um, but I think ultimately this does shape this paper as a um, paper that's based on often British policy uh, and British imperial politics more than necessarily having the WAFTA as the central actor. The WAFTA is still important and it's important to sort of understand the motivations. And I think that comes to Nicola, um, Nicola's point about the, um, um, about the fact that this is probably has to be situated around this idea of, of um, this being mostly around British imperial politics. Um, I think the, it was maybe slightly difficult in extrapolating this from the main argument of my thesis, which is that the British went, were trying to create these sorts of no, nominal forms of sovereignty, which uh, sort of play up the idea of the nation, and they believe that this can sort of co-opt a lot of national elites who will be happy to sort of um, use these symbolic forms of statehood, such as the League of Nations, um, without necessarily compromising political control. Uh, and this is what I sort of argue for, for India, maybe slightly less for the Dominions, who had a slightly more um, control of their affairs. Uh, and I think it's the case for Egypt, that they believed that the Egyptians wouldn't necessarily pursue um, a completely independent foreign policy if they were given totemic signs of statehood, such as membership of the League. Um, and they were happy to negotiate with people that, um, like Adli Pasha, who sort of clearly stated in negotiations with Milner that, they, that he would happily act as if um, Egypt was a bit like India in its foreign policy if they were allowed to join the League and um, become an independent state. Um, Sandrine Kutz um, comments on the events in India and who are the, who are the actors. Um, so there's a sort of tripartite form of actors in this paper, I suppose, which sort of shows this strange balance in Egyptian politics, uh, especially from 1924 onwards. Um, the Waft, the monarchy, and the British residency with the foreign, foreign office as uh, the extension in this case. Um, in relation to their foreign relations, I think the Egyptians are a very interesting case study in this respect. So all nationalist organizations look at nationalist struggles around the world as a basis to sort of see where the movement is going, but they often find ways to sort of justify um, their current movement if things are not going to plan. I think this is what I saw a lot in the case of Iraq, which I mentioned, is that so Iraq, um, become, uh, which is obviously a mandate, becomes independent and gains league membership. And this is in all the Egyptian newspapers, and they're all thinking, okay, like some WAF leaders are thinking, okay, we look like we're sort of being left behind a little bit. Iraq is, you know, quickly uh, getting a new status. Um, but then this was justified saying that Egypt is a more important country uh, with a greater national history and civilization than Iraq, which they see as a sort of a sort of colonial construct. Um, uh, in the case of India, there, I did find a few interesting um, connections. Again, I don't, didn't feel like there was a humongous amount of direct communication, even, even if they do look at each other's nationalist movements. Uh, I don't think that these movements are fully based off acting together. Um, for example, I don't know if I included this in the paper, but um, the second time that um, Zagrul was um, deported, um, initially he was going to be deported to Ceylon, but then due to the fear of um, sort of riots in India, due to the proximity, he was moved further to the seashells. Um, and there was a lot of discussion when they were debating giving Egypt independence, um, especially between Winston Churchill, who was actually against the idea, versus Milner, who was for it, um, about what sort of precedent it created to the rest of the empire when, in India, for example, they were dabbling with the system of diarchy, giving sort of limited institutions to richer Indians to participate in. Um, and what message would that send to, to India and Ireland if Egypt were to become independent? So the British themselves were also um, particularly aware of these and were debating what the implications were. Um, uh, yeah, so about the cooperation of the Egyptians, I think that's some, certainly something I would look, like to look at more, mostly because even if Egypt wasn't a member state of the League until 1937, at which point the League didn't have much sort of more time to operate effectively, um, considering the war started in 39. Um, Egypt was a member of many conferences and participated in quite a few international conventions uh, prior to its membership. Um, one of the senior Egyptian statesmen said, you know, Egypt should be the easiest country in the world to gain membership of the League, or we already participate so much in international society. 
Um, so I think that would have been, a, I think, something that I would need to sort of delve into more is to look at maybe how the Egyptians used these um, conferences to negotiate with other nationalist groups or other, not nationalist, sorry, not nationalist groups, other non-European states um, as well at Geneva. Um, I think you also raised the point about the, um, was it someone raised something about the monarchy? Uh, uh, about the, uh, yeah, the, the, um, how the British essentially sort of wrecked the Egyptian monarchy in the end, which is, which is true, but it also changes with the monarch in this case. Um, I mean, the, the British didn't particularly like Fouad, who was the main uh, monarch during this whole period, who was a very sort of savvy political actor, who wanted to sort of sideline the um, Waf to some extent. But I think even the monarchy wanted the same sort of trappings and symbols of statehood that we discussed, wanted that external policy. Um, things quickly change in 1936, uh, when Fouad dies and Farouk takes over. And Farouk is a lot more sympathetic to a different kind of nationalist ideal um, that the older monarchy was not, uh, which sort of heavily embraced Italian forms of uh, fascist thought. Um, um, in fact, there are some very rude songs the British used to sing about King Farouk in, uh, when they were occupying uh, Egypt during World War II, which I will not repeat. Um, <laughs> there were a few songs yesterday, but I don't think this one's appropriate. The fifth. Um, uh, Glenda Sluger's point on the, the story that this tells, um, maybe beyond just the question of legitimacy and, and statehood. Um, I, I, I'm wondering if it's partially due to the basis on which British imperialism was justified, to, not justified, legitimized it, um, following Egypt's independence. Um, and I think it's this idea of the Monroe Treaty that the British bring up and the reservations. It's that the foreign policy aspect is the point in which Britain is dominating Egypt. So for the Egyptians, if they can gain um, external representation, that already is a, is a large step towards removing British control in their view. Um, the British have a monopoly on relations with the Egyptians until they sign um, a treaty. Um, yeah, I think uh, the financial aspect, again, a very good point, which I admit I, have no, I could certainly do more to to look, in, look into and whether there are other points that they gain here. Um, again, because I was looking at this as a sort of um, part of the same question as the Dominions and, and India, mostly India and Ireland, um, I look at this more as a history of um, an attempt of, to decolonize more than maybe some of the development aspects, which I think would be really interesting to look at. Um, and, um, Oh, one more point, yeah, oh, uh, the Sudan as well, that's very important about this story as well, because the League can act as an arbiter for um, Egypt's new status, um, but there's also a hope that the League can be brought in to find a sort of settlement um, over who will control the Sudan afterwards, and that's the sort of interesting facet about Egyptian nationalism is it sort of wants Egyptian independence, but it also has its own sort of irredentist imperial claim based off uh, Muhammad Ali's previous invasions in the early 19th century of, of Sudan. And so it sees it as a sort of integral part of the Egyptian nation. Um, so it goes beyond just the hydrological aspect in which the British can turn the water on and off um, in Sudan. There's also a strong nationalist element that we must, we have a right to Sudan and the British are simply sort of caretakers. Um, there were, uh, the British essentially re, uh, recaptured the Sudan for Egypt, uh, but governed it for themselves. Um, I think might be coming to Michael's point. On the contagion of sovereignty, um, and I think you're sort of pointing towards maybe the sort of the Wilsonian moment sort of argument, the, the sort of desire to have this international recognition from Western actors. Is that, is that sort of what you're talking No, it was, it was, I mean, maybe the Armitage thing was, you know, a, a sideshow. <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's the fact that I, they, they, they seem to be so keen uh, for, for these external trappings of statehood in, in your rendering, as they, I'm sure, were, that it makes me wonder, well, why? Uh, why, why do they want this so badly? Yeah, I mean, at the same time, they, they, want, they want it, but at, they're willing to forego it in the way that other states don't as well. Like, other states are, are accepting Britain's terms, and the Irish are accepting the Brit uh, Britain's terms. 
the Iraqis are accepting Britain's terms. So you could potentially argue that though it's an important facet, the Egyptians are willing to hold out for other demands, such as Sudan and the removing Britain's occupation of urban zones, and are willing to forgo that membership as well. So I would also argue that it's important, but it's not necessarily as important as it is for other nationalist movements too. Um, but again, I think it, I think it is a, a belief that, despite the fact that we know that the League was heavily constructed by uh, British and Americans at, at the Paris Peace Conference and has a lot of that colonial structure within its covenant, um, it, oh, I think the Egyptians definitely did view it as a sort of guarantor as well of the, the treaty. The idea was that the Anglo-Egyptian treaty would be registered in Geneva and then um, by putting it in Geneva, it sort of meant that part of Egyptian sovereignty would be guaranteed through um, the sort of international, um, international recognition of it. There's an interesting case of the Irish as well, um, I think in 1925, which is quite similar, where, so Irish, Irish sovereignty or quasi-sovereignty as a dominion is, is based off the uh, Anglo-Irish Treaty. Now, from the British perspective, Ireland is a dominion, but it's still within the British Empire. So the agreement isn't an interstate agreement. It's, it's sort of like uh, an agreement between you know, the, the metropole to the periphery. It's not between two different states. It's between some, within the same unit. So when the Irish go and register the Anglo-Irish Treaty in Geneva, it's, it's a complete sort of legalistic meltdown for the British because they, it sort of confirms the fact that Ireland is a sort of separate state. Um, so it's this strange quasi-fiction that's what they're trying to maintain. But Egypt is different here because the British do decide to at least um, symbolically declare it as independent and is, is seen as a separate unit, at least nominally, not, maybe not de facto. Um, did you have a, your second question? Why the British blocked it, per se? Because I think that there was a belief that, the, um, the, despite the fact that Britain had a strong hand at the League of Nations, I think there was a belief the Egyptians could use um, the international structures as a, as a way of to gain recourse. And the British weren't exactly sure that the, the cards were fully stacked in their favor, favor either. Um, especially when it came to the inauguration of the new court in The Hague, they believed that there was certainly a case that the Egyptians could complicate Britain's control of the Sudan. Um, but, and it also, I think it undermined Britain's fiction that it was willing to work through international institutions too. I mean, after the Lacano treaties, the, the sort of spirit of Lacano, the Egyptians are kind of hoping, especially the Labour governments, they're hoping the British are going to be um, sort of more internationalist in their mindset. Um, but when it's clear that they're not willing to give League membership without an agreement, without an alliance, the Egyptians accused the, sort of, the British of being sort of false friends in this regard. All right, thanks so much for a very interesting paper and, and a rich discussion. Uh, as a Latin Americanist, by the way, I couldn't help but uh, uh, finding the British understanding of the Monroe Doctrine a little funny. Um, <laughs> but uh, never mind. All right, uh, let's, let's move on to, to Joram Spalder's paper then, uh, which takes us into more cultural, intellectual history terrain. Uh, the floor is yours for a few initial words. Thanks. Good morning, everyone, and first of all, a big thank you to you, Michael, for uh, inviting me to this conference and for giving me the chance to get feedback for, uh, from a community of scholars whose work in many ways, does it work? Yeah? yeah. Whose work in many ways has shaped my own thinking uh, over the past years on, on, on the great India imagination. Um, so now, before going into note-taking mode, let me try to summarize the main pitch of this paper by sort of connecting it to the discussions that we had yesterday, and of course we had many. Um, so after dinner last night, I wisely opted for herbal tea instead of coffee uh, to make sure that I would actually get some sleep. Uh, but I hadn't reckoned with Bernard Jacques' keynote, um, and my mind was sort of still buzzing with some of the thoughts uh, you left with us. Um, so I think that we could think of this great India template that I write about in this paper um, as exactly such a shared cultural heritage community uh, that Bernard uh, alluded to. Uh, but what I think is particularly intriguing uh, in this case um, is that Greater India did not sort of follow uh, the logic of an intergenerational sort of transmission within a national community, but was in fact generated through knowledge networks that connected Indian anti-colonial nationalists to archaeologists and Indologists uh, in, in Batavia, Hanoi, Paris and Leiden. Um, so for intellectuals such as Tagore, but also Benar Kumar Sarkar and many others, 
this was sort of a forgotten past uh, and a key to sort of understand India's civilizational self in the interwar period. Uh, and I argue that the consequences of this sort of reconfiguration of the idea of India, not only in spatial, but also in historiographical terms, are still very much with us today. Um, so in the interwar sort of greater India imagination, the shrines of Indian nationalism um, were not located in South Asia at all. So sort of Rebecca's West fields of blackbirds, I think you alluded to those, Bernard, uh, where in, in this case, actually, the temples of Angkor Wat in Cambodia and the Buddhist shrine of Bora Budur uh, in Indonesia, on Java, but also the art, uh, for example, that uh, had been recovered along the Silk Roads. Um, and then also this sort of imagined community was not limited to Indians at all, uh, but in the vision of Tagore and Kali Dashnak, it sort of transforms this, this whole Great India template into a panationist vision uh, that sort of encompassed the entire East. Now, of course, this didn't exactly work out in the end, and, and as I also tried to show, this vision was problematic on many levels. Um, but I think it's an important trend in sort of Indian anti-colonial nationalism and, and internationalism that has remained largely understudied because of methodological nationalism. And I think if you take a bit more of a global or transcolonial approach as I try to do by tracing these knowledge networks, um, I think we, we, yeah, we, we, we find a different picture. Um, I think I, I leave it at that and I'm looking forward to your comments, feedback, criticism. Thank you, Joram. Uh, yes, Glenda, Richard, Jimmy, Tiffany, uh, Thomas, Nicola, everybody. Uh, so. Can I get ready? <laughs> Actually, I probably should go last because I feel like I'm the least, you know, the least informed person. But I'm going to do that terrible thing of, like, I've been to Dunhuang and seen those um, statues. And, in fact, I, I felt a complete affinity with the French and Dutch interpretation, having seen them and feeling like, yeah, that's what you'd think, right, if you saw all this. But um, the, the question I have, so, again, you know, other people will speak more specifically to this, you know, really fan fascinating comparative um, history, I think, and drawing out you know, how, how, how we have to pass, you know, Orientalisms and, and think about the differences between imperial, um, you know, perspectives on, on uh, this part of the world, apart from how it's, you know, it's in, um, uh, uh, taken up in the Indian context itself. But I was wondering, so sorry about this, but, um, you know, I think there's a framing of this that you could use in other contexts, right, when you're giving talks, and that would be about how the Chinese then appropriate that same you know, archaeology, and really, you know, so that's another empire in a way, right? So in the contemporary context, you know, do you have any thoughts on, you know, how you bring that to bear, or what, what that means, how, how, how it's still an appropriatable kind of um, uh, view of the past and being retranslated in the Chinese context? I mean, I have specific things too about, I think your conclusion doesn't specifically speak to how the paper develops or what you set up at the beginning some of the, the, what you say it was about, I thought, oh, I didn't kind of get that from the beginning. Because, but it is a beautifully structured and written paper. It really is. So I'll leave it at that and you guys can ask more experienced questions. I think, I, I lost track, but I think Richard was next. Um, maybe I change order depending on seating. Uh, <laughs> Just beginning with, um, to echo Mikhail at the beginning, uh, all of these papers really were, were excellent and uh, just holding myself back to make just minimal interventions. Um, but Yuram, um, I, I suppose the question which, which um, came to mind for me as I read this is that why is this not being put into the broader perspective of the ways in which archaeology is is central to forms of nationalisms. I think the Latin American case is a particularly useful one for you, the ways in which uh, in uh, New Granada, in you know, Colombia uh, in the 19th century, uh, Mexico in the early 20th century, um, uh, and, and there are many other cases. You've got a kind of program, programs of archaeology which are, and, and the kind of construction of, of imagined frontiers of the past uh, based on, on acknowledging deep time. Uh, if you want to go fight wider afield, I mean, in a sense, 
forms of European nationalism also have a, have a distinct archaeological turn. Uh, Camden's Britannia uh, and the kind of program of recovering the kind of antiquity of England's past linked to kind of early modern English uh, well, I don't know, some people don't like using nationalism there in the period. I have, I have no problems with that. Uh, early modern English nationalism. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, so it seems to me there's, 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 there's a lot of really important comparative questions to be brought into focus here, uh, to, 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 which in a way are operating uh, around this, uh, uh, this, this greater India moment, uh, which is being constructed from a couple of directions, both, you know, from a, from a South Asian side and then also from a kind of colonial uh, uh, side. Um, Thank you. Uh, Tiffany, Jimmy, I've got you, but Nicola's sitting nearby, so let's, uh, let's have her. Thank you. Um, hi, Yoram. I, I really enjoyed this. It was absolutely fascinating and very nice to see someone thinking about history of knowledge um, in relation to nationalism and decolonization like this. Um, I, I suppose I say this in all sympathy, but, but I kind of feel there is a there is a structural problem with the paper in that you're bringing two stories together, uh, but you're keeping them apart in, in the way that you present the paper. And I, I think there probably isn't an obvious way around that. And just in terms of the sort of logic of reading, you, you probably have to, to keep it more or less separate. But um, I think you could perhaps do a little bit more to kind of uh, frame it for the reader more effectively. So for example, um, about halfway through um, page 16 or something, you mentioned the fact that the Greater India concept has not been thought about very much in the history of anti-colonial nationalism. And I think that it would be much better sort of framed at the beginning alongside the, its place within the British imperial imaginings. And so you sort of start out by contrasting or, or bringing together the two. And, and I think uh, uh, then you know there will be ways as you as you go through in the way that you write it, just in kind of constantly sort of taking the reader back to the connections and, and highlighting the connections a little more. But I think it's it's a great piece and, and really fascinating. So Jamil and Tiffany over there. I really enjoyed your paper. I really enjoyed all the papers. But for you, I was wondering in particular, because um, I, much like Nicola, I really wanted to know more of the connections, the sort of more of the transnational connections. And I kept thinking about Nico Slate's work on, um, so he wrote a book on, I think in 2012, um, Colored Cosmopolitanisms, um, and thinking about these interconnections and how that contributes to a greater, a greater sense of Indian, sort of greater, greater India. So I'm wondering, how can you sort of tease out these these connections and these sort of multiple greater India images or imaginaries that are emerging as a result? Um, I I also wondered you sort of gesture to the sort of discussions about um, you know um, gendered characterizations of um, Bengal, and I'm wondering if there's also certainly sort of gendered um, approaches to knowledge production and networks and how that fits in, because I think um, Slate talks a little bit about that, um, especially sort of it's um, sort of um, the subcontent that's linked to sort of African Americans and sort of the gendered approaches that they've taken on. So I'm wondering if that would maybe be a useful way of sort of thinking through some of this a little bit more. Sorry, that's a question slash comment. Um, I, I, of course, I know that I like this book, but I'm, I want to say, think about the publication process and the reception in India. Um, <laughs> since this is going to happen, uh, there's no way to avoid it, so maybe you can start thinking about your press conferences and releases and, and questions like that. So, uh, going back to the, the Battle of Kosovo, Prince Lazar metaphor, I mean, you, since you referred to it, uh, obviously the Serbians have a sense of victimhood, but then there's a very imperial, I mean, uh, on the other hand, there's an imperial one which was achieved in Yugoslavia. There's also a very oppressive one that then, every time you talk about Kosovo, of course, you are also denying Bosnians and Kosovans. You have some sort of enemy within 
in, in the metaphor. So your book will then have this conversation with uh, Manan Ahmed's book about the idea of the India being a Hindu land and the Muslims being an um, outside invaders that then uh, empowers the Hindu uh, fundamentalists. Uh, but in your period, it, it doesn't look very right-wingish. It seems more inclusive, more cosmopolitan. Uh, so the one question you will get is that when did this turn into a, a narrative um, that is making that distinction that this land belonged to us, for the indigenous people? But then you're also saying that, well, you, you were a kind of imperialist indigenous, right? You were indigenous, but you also expand... Um, so can you predict what might be the readings and how would you respond uh, to, to that thing? Are, because are you then depriving the Hindu fundamentalist sense that uh, we are the indigenous populations, we were never colonizers, and these are the bad people? Because, I mean, it, it goes to, I mean, if you want to extend it, to, to some people say that China is too big, but then if China, if the greater China metaphor, uh, it, it, it's achieved, right? They have Uyghur land. If they didn't have it, they would have said, this could be ours. But they don't have Korea. They could have claimed Korea as well. I mean, that's one argument I heard from a Korean colleague, that if it wasn't for Japan, Korea could have been part of China too. It's great, part of greater China. So you, 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 your readers might go in all kinds of directions in that. All right, I, oh, Thomas, yeah. Um, yeah, needs, needless to say, I, I really enjoyed this paper, um, and I had a couple of questions. So, um, part of this this sort of move to to look at Indian history outside is also caused by Britain, uh, Britain's sort of archaeological neglect of Hindu sites, and I was sort of wondering because there's so much attention from French and Dutch archaeologists in in uh, Indochina and in um, the uh, in Indonesia. How do budding nationalist movements in Indochina and and um, Indonesia see themselves? Uh, do they become angered by the sort of neglect of French and uh, French and Dutch archaeologists of their sort of grassroots uh, culture, or do they also start to imagine themselves as sort of part of this sort of greater Indic tradition? Um, and the second point is that I mean, I actually I, I didn't mind the opening structure about the sort of idea of. India being a place that is acted upon by foreign sort of invaders in the sort of British tradition, but I think the point goes way, well below, uh, well before the um, the Chola and the, these uh, invasions from from uh, Afghanistan and beyond. Um, but I think that the point could be made, especially in the British archaeological tradition, of going back to the, the sort of old argument about the uh, Aryan invasion theory, which is still sort of the the original kind of debate uh, as it's the basis of Vedic culture in India. And I think that it's important because, I mean, like the, you kind of finish on the note of Modi and are at the RSS and the government now, now sort of sponsor this kind of pseudoscientific idea of the sort of reverse Aryan invasion theory, the sort of out of India theory. And I'm wondering if that has the, the sort of genealogy and the sort of notion that even like the ancient Indian culture was the one that spread outwards into Central Asia, um, not, you know, not that Central Asians came into India. Thank you. All right, I currently don't see any other hand, so uh, let, let me add one. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah, Bernie. Hi, I really enjoyed the paper and really learned from it. Um, this is a comment not so much for revising the paper, but for future prospects for you know, using uh, this kind of uh, the rich vein of research that you've got here. Um, I find it really interesting in the context of the way in which various versions of cosmopolitanism or more cosmopolitan visions are constructed. Tagore is, you know, uh, in the broader, you know, uh, you know, a generalized discourse about cosmopolitanism is, ah, you see, in, in India, there was somebody who had a cosmopolitan vision. But what you're showing here is, I think, re what's really interesting is, look, it's, it's been said many times, that there's no cosmopolitan vision of cosmopolitanism, right? Uh, just like there's no globalist vision of globalism. Uh, that the way in which a more 
cosmopolitan, greater world history, historical perspective is constructed given, you know, from, from different sources, uh, varies wonderfully. And here's a really good story and way to tell it, I think. You've got, you're, I'm, I'm just thinking here, like I said, what some communities that might be interested in this research uh, in, in the way in which, uh, what, what, what you're bringing up. So not so much for this paper, but for the broader reach of your research. Thanks. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll add one, um, mostly building on, on what Nicola and, and Tiffany said. I, um, again, I, I, I enjoyed this very much. You, you gave us a clear indication of where you want to publish it. <laughs> Uh, so, 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 so my intervention would be more uh, specifically text-based. Um, so, so, so first of all, in the in the introduction, uh, I think you're very effective at uh, at framing a question, uh, as Glenda said, which, however, in in, in the end, then uh, somehow appears in a different form, right? So, so you say uh, you you look at how and why this came in, in, into being, and then. And then, as, as Nicholas said, I also felt that you basically have two parts, right? Well, one part is the Dutch and the French archaeologists who bring this into being, and then how the how Indian intellectuals pick it up. Um, and, and, and first of all, of course, the structure uh, reinforces in the reader a sort of causality, that the, which is that the French and the Dutch invent this. Uh, which might well be the case, right? Uh, and, and I'm fine with that. Uh, but it just shouldn't be only the paper structure that, um, that, that, that gives the reader that impression. But it should actually you, it should be you who wants to say that. <laughs> uh, that, that, that would be my first point. Um, and, and, and the second one, and again, as Nicola said, I also had the feeling I, 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 I can't come up with an obvious way around it. But it's not exactly clear what the link between the, the, the Dutch and the French archaeologists and, and the Indian intellectuals is. Uh, because, the, because the Indian intellectuals, supposedly, they, they can pick it up or not. Uh, and, and, and they do. Uh, and and uh, it, it's, it's, I, I think it could be clearer why and how, as, as, you, as you frame it in your own introduction, uh, th they, are, they are doing this and not something else. Uh, and then I only had a few more very specific comments, um, which I can give you later, uh, that, that, that sometimes you give a lot of very detailed information and long lists of names, which I think, uh, uh, certainly for the HR, but, but even for, for comparative studies in, in society and history, probably need, need uh, to be cut down a little bit. Um, so if there's no... More hands now. Maybe you, you. Yeah, maybe I can have the final word yeah. on it all. <laughs> well, I mean, thanks so much. These were very stimulating comments in many ways. Um, how to tie it together? So, I think on the one hand, uh, the interesting question that I sense was here in the room was sort of what is the the timing of all of this? When did this Great India become sort of a, a Hindu nationalist sort of projection as opposed to this more soft Asianist sort of? strength that Tagore uh, and Kali Dashnak uh, sort of pushed for. Um, and it was already there in the interwar period. Fir Savakar, the Hindutva ideologue, already has this sort of great India sentiment sort of creeping in his work. Um, Sakar, who was not strictly speaking a fascist or a, a, a Hindutva sort of figure, definitely flirted with this ideology and, and thus sort of tap into similar rhetoric. Um, but the crucial point, I think, is that it was another, uh, um, another political sort of conjuncture. India moved, uh, Tagore passed away in the early 40s, and, and India moved towards independence. And it was not sort of a Hindu nationalist framework that Nehru adopted for the nation state. It was a secular, plural, inclusive nationalism. And, and Nehru was in many ways sort of a hair of, of Tagore in that sense. Uh, subscribing to a certain sense of brotherhood among, well, among Asian nations. And he was sort of savvy enough to not sort of, you know, frame it in greater India sort of rhetoric, but he, he actually was very much influenced by this idea of Indian civilization as this expansive sort of inclusive benevolent force in, in Asia. Um, and I, I write more extensively about that elsewhere. Um, 
So, so in other words, what has changed in India right now is it's, it's, it's simply a different geopolitical conjuncture. India is, is a much more prominent power right now, and, and Modi is a Hindu, basically comes straight from Hindutva, and he is in power now, so he can basically, without apology, sort of push for this vision of greater India. And, and this happens also in a moment when, when China is, of course, pushing for very similar agendas, as, as Glenda and also Shamil also alluded to. Um, in fact, yesterday I, I jumped in between on another panel uh, in another conference where I talked exactly about the sort of Silk Road template, uh, basically together with Tim Winter, who is based in Australia, um, who looks at this from a Chinese perspective, trying to see how we can conceptualize this today. Um, because in, to a certain extent, these are competing discourses at the moment. Both try to project their sort of civilizational, expensive vision across Asia via not only the land sort of Silk Roads and Dunhuang, but also via the maritime, the maritime Silk Roads, as they are called. Um, and this has all sort of implications for sort of cultural heritage, sort of the way that this frames uh, the whole digital humanities drive in, in, in China is very much preoccupied with this as well. Um, and as we see with Belt and Road, uh, the sort of Chinese sort of economic infrastructural initiative, this is very much sort of an expansionist agenda, sort of framed and cloaked into this very sort of seducive metaphor of connectivity and cosmopolitanism, sort of like Greater India, tapping into the Asian past to sort of make a new future. Um, the crucial difference, I think, with the Indian template is that, that in the Indian case, this is so far not backed really by sort of money. A sort of concrete investment. It's a lot of rhetoric, um, and, and I think some of the other questions went into the direction, uh, I think Thomas, you also mentioned that to what extent is this great India discourse uh, at all relevant for, for nationalist movements in the interwar period in Southeast Asia, and even today, well, it, to a certain extent, it hasn't been. Um, of course, the French recovery of Angkor uh, was a big boost later on for Khmer nationalism, but Borobudur is, is kind of has a very ambivalent position. It's it's a Buddhist shrine, uh, sort of Indonesian nationalism defines itself mostly in, in sort of Muslim terms. Um, so, and then there are all these colonial discourses uh, also around these these monuments. For example, in in Cambodia, Angkor was very much framed as a, um, a as a rupture. There were these sort of Indic monuments, and now we have the cameras here, and and the French sort of postulated this as a civilizational sort of chasm between what was and, and sort of the, 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 uh, the realities they encountered uh, in the early 20th century. Um, and, and obviously right now there's a lot of contestation over these sort of monuments uh, with Indian sort of uh, Hindutva ideologists, uh, uh, ideologues, uh, actually trying to re-sacralize these monuments actually going to Angkor, trying to sort of incorporate it in a, in a pilgrimage sort of circuit, sort of linking that site with Hindu shrines in India, um, and, and using the sort of colonial Indian art rope that goes straight to this sort of great India moment in the interwar period. Um, uh, and this is very much resisted in, in, in Cambodia, and, and there's a lot of back and forth sort of like fussing about this. Um, but at the same time, as with Belt and Road, there is also a lot of sort of the, the symbolic bridge building going on in Asia today, where there is on this sort of more superficial level, this notion of Asian bonds and sort of the Ardis links, and, and the Ardis links. I mean, uh, the few other scholars that have worked on Great India see this very much as a chauvinist sort of projection of Indian nationalists, and, and seem to pretend as if there is no such thing as an Asian sort of trans-regional circulation of, of religions, art, and aesthetic in, uh, impulses that, that sort of come from India, that, that, is, that is a reality, that is a, that is a truth that, that somehow um, makes this not just a political discourse, but also um, a much more ambivalent sort of in-between uh, discourse of cultural heritage and, and sort of politics. Um, I think I, I leave it at that for, for now. I don't know if anyone else has still any other thoughts or comments or... I think we're good in, in terms of time. Thank yeah. you so much. Um, all right, looking forward to, to seeing this published too. Uh, final one, David, uh, who's wearing, as you know, two hats as the, as the mastermind of this event, uh, as well as the author of a brilliant paper about Israeli development uh, work. Right, floor is yours. And then we have the usual round of comments. <laughs>
Thank you. I, I think I want to be brief because I want to make the most of this privilege that uh, Michael um, was so kind to give me in uh, workshopping a paper, even though I'm pretty much halfway through my PhD project. So everything and anything you say will be recorded and put to good use. Um, so let me begin by just outlining a few themes or motivations here, and very just to get us started about uh, the conversation. Basically, um, at the background of this paper is a dissatisfaction, I think, with scholarship on experts, the way the ones that I read currently. Um, and this dissatisfaction, I think I, I quoted to myself what uh, one of my co-supervisors, Jean-François Bayard, said, uh, il faut les sociologiser. Um, my idea is that an ethnography of, expert, um, of experts will also echo Pierre Dubois's playful reversal of, of Pierre Dubois, Pierre Bourdieu. Pierre Bourdieu's playful reversal of the ethnographic gaze uh, to the knowledge producers themselves. Um, and in many ways, uh, this is a story of a social group of upwardly mobile uh, Ashkenazi Israelis um, who, who participated in a development encounter that, um, drawing on, on yesterday's nationalism and internationalism kind of panel, it really spills over both. So it's a transnational encounter um, that was happening within and across international borders, both in Israel and in Africa, and that was happening simultaneously. Um, and so, in a way, it's, it's my little contribution to uh, internationalizing Israeli history. Um, and to kind of break off debates that were happening within Israeli academia that kind of focus on that encounter, but only the way that it is happening within the Israeli borders between Mizrahim and Ashkenazi. Um, and where I'm going with this currently and where my thinking is at is basically pointing out the centrality of the household of the enclave and of the expat uh, network uh, and that is grounded in specific places. That is not only in the expert's own home, but also in the embassy and in the school. Um, and I'll get to this, I hope, in the future, to the workplace as well, to where the man goes to, to basically be an expert. Uh, uh, in, in the context that, that he sent. Um, but I kind of am drawn more to the trappings of competence, of familiarity, um, and, this, and this kind of maintaining these trappings rather than the kind of the knowledge itself or the, the action itself of development um, I, I see the, the family and, and specifically the wives uh, as a central kind of uh, a piece in the puzzle. Um, and it, I start the paper with kind of the way that the Israeli foreign ministry is actually really coaching, uh, um, trying to intervene directly in how experts' wives behave and comport themselves and what they should and should not do. And, and finally, a final theme, which is, is kind of in its infancy, so I don't know what you want to do uh, with that, but it is about Israel's unique placement within a kind of um, racial and geopolitical moment of decolonization. And in a way, a lot of uh, scholars have said, well, by going to Africa, Israelis kind of reinvented themselves as white, European experts coming to help uh, uh, people in the third world. Um, and I engage with that just by saying that this does not happen only on the level of utterances, but we should really look to, you know, mundane things like salaries, like, like uh, living arrangements, you know, where they lived, how they, uh, 
with whom they engage under what circumstances. Um, and yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, David. I see Glenda's hands, Alex's, Jamil's. Hey, David. So, so, so interesting, and particularly, you know, that last question that you posed. I'll come to that. But what struck, struck me is that I think there's a kind of, you know, obviously the historiography you've chosen, the feminist imperialism historiography, you know, it works. But actually, there's another historiography that's embedded already in this. I mean, at the end, you talk about diplomats and experts. There's an historiography of diplomacy, which is all about the role of the wives. And I'd point you to, and particularly in this period, I mean, there's a longer historiography, of course, you know, the 19th century and the 20th, and how a modern idea of diplomacy shifts women out of the salon into the household as the complement of the husband ambassador, right? And, um, but for this period, there's a really good essay by uh, a Swedish historian on how the Swedish Foreign Office deals with wives in the 60s and 70s. In fact, they go on strike. The diplomats' wives go on strike. Mm -hmm. And it's in the uh, book I edited with Carolyn James on uh, women and diplomacy uh, in international politics, right? So have a look. But um, the other issue for me, though, the other question that I think is really interesting is, and I've only started to realise this, that there is something about expert couples in the latter half of the 20th century in the context of development and international organisations, for example. So you'll often find we know about the... Well, we know about Gunnar Madal and we know a lot about Alva. And, in fact, they were quite separate by the time they kind of work, get into this development area. But there's, you know, um, Morgan and Esther Berzerup. And you'll know about Morgan, he's famous, but she's not. And they're couples and they get appointed together in these contexts, but you don't hear about the women. So sometimes, maybe, I'm just wondering if some of your wives are actually experts, right? Can we find that out, right? And so are they subsumed by this category? But they're actually there in this other context. The other thing that I find interesting, um, and this is from the Alba Medal example, um, that, you know, so someone like her, the reason why she gets involved in development is she feels that the Swedish example of moving from the rural, from a rural culture to a modern industrialised culture is one that can be replicated in the developing world. She sees Sweden as a developed... So I'm just wondering whether, you know, to take your third point about understanding salaries, blah, blah, but actually is there a model of Israel that they think, whether it's the kibbutz or some other kind of development model, that they think in a... It's not a non-imperial way necessarily, but actually, but it is a different kind of idea about what you have to bring. It's not civilization, but a, a, something you've learnt, right, about how you get from point A to point B and that you want to bring that to another context because of the similarities, not because of the differences, but actually similarities. So is there something like that there too that we could, you know, sort of, you know, unweave from the, the tanglement of, of motives and, um, and, and ideas, which is not to, not to challenge the imperial context at all, but to nuance it in some way. Okay, uh, apologies to Lydia and Alex, but I go by geography of the room now. So, Sandrine. I will be very quick because you asked all the questions I wanted to ask. I'm so, <laughs> so sorry about that. No, I was very, I mean, about the woman and so on, I completely agree. And I, w I was also very uh, curious about, about the fact that these women could be experts themselves. So it was your question. But my, the second question I also wanted to ask is this pos particular position of Israel as a kind of bridge builder between developed and underdeveloped world. And, you know, I'm very, uh, I'm very interested in that question because it's exactly how uh, Eastern Europe is playing its own role in the development policy. You know, we are the underdeveloped, which have been developed very quickly because of socialism. So also this kind of kibbutz model and so on and so forth. So how does it play a role also for Israel? And that uh, connected to that, you know, there is. We know that with international organisation, you know, what they do, they are trying. Uh, to create patterns in a certain way, to create models. Do the Israelis try to build themselves or to, to, to present themselves as a particular model? And if they want to present themselves as a model, which kind of model and to which kind of audience do they present themselves as a model? Do they speak to other people, for example, in international organizations? Do they sell their model outside, and not just in Africa, but in other countries? And again, it's not a kind of new imperial history, but it's more really a kind of new international history that I am uh, trying to address here. 
All right, Jamil. Um, thank you, David. It's a great work. Uh, I just have a clarification question. Is this also part of the, in the rest of the chapters, a kind of bigger project on Israel uh, from the very beginning, Zionism as this kind of civilizing mission? And this, this chapter, of course, is kind of performing that civilizing mission, but it's challenged um, in early years of Israel by uh, Palestinian nationalism. It's like how important it is to kind of prove uh, Ashkenazi claim that project of Israel itself is an extension of the Europe civilizing uh, mission. And then around the same time, there were also there was also American and Soviet competition. So how much do they align with that American modernization theory? And I should say there are parallels that the, the Turks also wanted to prove themselves how European they are by doing similar type of work in alliance with the American modernization projects. Um, so they may, you, they may be very similar. But going to the Turks, of course, there is this question, uh, a critique for the Turkish Ottoman modernization is that Ottoman men were modernizers, but they kept traditional family at home. There was this contradiction that were always condemned and criticized for not being truly modern by transforming the family. Is there some sort of, a, in the background, an implicit uh, discussion if, if Ashkenazi, well, I guess Jews were also modernizing, but then they were they had difficulty with the like Muslim law, Jewish law, not going all the way into modernizing their family. Let's have uh, Lydia and Alex up there. Thank you, David. Really fascinating paper. Um, I bet this is about, Alex is about to say this, but if you haven't already read it, uh, Benjamin Siegel's article in the AHR, the Kibbutz and the Ashram, uh, really, well, first of all, it's an excellent article, and second of all, the way he connects sort of social, sort of uh, socialist uh, Gandhian utopias and sort of transnational uh, networks of expertise um, between uh, Israeli kibbutzim and um, the Sarvodia movement in India, I think, would be uh, illuminating. Um, about this piece specifically, what I find really fascinating is how you're combining sort of the three elements I often see in these sort of post-imperial uh, encounters, which are uh, missionaries, anthropologists, and uh, well, sometimes it's uh, war, but sometimes it's also development experts, where the family units you're describing are very similar to how I see, how I've, how I've seen um, missionary families organized. And I mean, you point to that literature, but I also think that some of the almost more social organization of their sort of particular postings might be helpful. And I'm thinking of Emily Conroy Kurtz's work on Christian imperialism, though it's much earlier. And uh, I'll send it to you. Um, and, and then second, with the anthropologists, it's you who are taking the anthropological lens onto uh, your subject. So it's not quite the same. And, um, and then development, of course, is how um, is the discourse that so many uh, of us sort of think about or and these um, networks of expertise is a sort of there's a big long literature and you illuminate it so i'm wondering if you can do more with the fact that you're inter using those sort of three paradigms for studying these kinds of encounters but you're not using them in an equivalent fashion um and what what can be done with that and then my uh, third sort of thought is, and this is again from my research on missionaries, is one of the things that's fascinating is what's acceptable for a, a pastor's wife at home, in this case in the United States, that kind of behavior of being purely a housewife becomes no longer acceptable abroad 
when you have domestic help, and when there's this sense of international mission. And then often on these uh, sort of compounds, you have single women who are part of the sort of either missionary or development enterprise. And then the social relations between single and married women uh, be can become quite tense because the single women tend to be much better educated and are doing jobs comparable to mar the married women's husbands and how if there's any of that kind of interpersonal story uh, that you're able to sort of bring forward from the records you have available. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, fascinating paper, David, as I think most of the comments uh, suggest. And, and yes, Lydia is correct. I was going to point you to that Benjamin Siegel article, but also another kind of historiographical potential point of, of entry. I mean, uh, Glenda referred to the gender and diplomacy. Lydia is talking about missionary historiography. I'd, I'd be curious if any of the historiography about the kind of opening up of the U.S. diplomatic corps in the 1960s and 70s to African Americans, for example, especially in Africa, if any of that would illuminate the, uh, sort of your thinking about questions of, of um, upward mobility, for example, uh, and, and to the degree, and I don't know the answer to this, to the degree to which uh, American Jews also began to enter the diplomatic corps after a period in which I would assume uh, in the pre-war period they were largely excluded from what was a very waspy sector of, of uh, American society. So I'd be curious if there's any connection there. Uh, and maybe the Peace Corps would be another place to look. Just in, historiographically speaking about how other people have addressed the, these issues, as, as I think Lydia suggested as well. And then uh, uh, one thing that did occur to me, and again, I don't know the answer, but at what point do uh, Israeli women begin military service because that would actually be something that's very different in the Israeli context, which is that there is um, that, I don't know if I would say tradition, but that possibility. So I don't know if that, that comes later after 73 or if that's already going on in, in, in the 60s, but um, that would be an interesting dimension that makes the Israeli case very different, I think, when it comes to to sort of gender and internationalism. But, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the larger frame, which is this internationalization of Israeli history, I've got a student who's working on this as well in terms of US, uh, South African-Israeli relations, and it's really an exciting uh, set of developments. So yeah, I'm excited to see where this goes. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much, David, for, for this very great paper, actually. I learned a lot from this. And, and actually, my comments were going in a similar direction as, as Lydia's, but she put it much more eloquently, so I tried to pitch this a little differently. Um, so, so I had this feeling that, on the one hand, you have this ethnographic approach, and there's this strong sort of um, comparative dimension. Um, and, and regarding the sort of comparative dimension, I was wondering, you could take this in all sort of directions, right? Um, but I, I felt that you focus, I mean, so on the one hand, there's the question of geography here and timing, because I think you had a lot on, on the Raj in there, which is a South Asia, it's a completely different sort of geopolitical conjuncture, it's colonial times, there's a completely different history. So I was wondering, do you need that comparative lens sort of there, or is it, would it be useful to, to focus more on the sort of post-war momentum and the Cold War sort of positionality of Israel in this in this new world as a newly emerging nation state and so, so in other words I was wondering if, if you need that sort of this historiography to sort of make sense of this Israeli case study um, and another question I had uh, is more about sources I was wondering to what extent you could draw on memoirs and sort of autobiographies fiction uh, just what is out there Um, yeah, thank you for, for presenting that, David. Um, I wanted to pick up on the, maybe the, the racial aspect with the Mizrahim and maybe even Ethiopian Jews as well. Um, now, I think, that, I mean, this is a development studies school, but I think everyone knows there's a sort of asymmetry in, in development between the developer and those that receive the development. And I thought it was interesting how you sort of tie this idea that the they have this sort of handbook where they're not allowed to or they, at least they're not supposed to appear um, as if they're replicating the sort of colonial Indian experience, but 
at the same time, it's kind of like their, the whiteness of these Ashkenazis is sort of integral to, to their identity as a, as a developer. And I'm wondering if in your interviews you came across any Mizrahi or, or any Ethiopian Jews who were involved with this and also how they were perceived, were they perceived as sort of legitimate um, developers simply because of their ethnicity or, you know, I'm just, how, so, yeah, so what extent is the sort of whiteness built into the, the development narrative, I think? All right, since I don't see any more hands, I, I'll follow my habit of piling more <laughs> things on, on your plate in the spirit of uh, more ideas. I, so this is a beautifully written paper. I, it, it reminded me of two things that I, uh, I've come across in the, in the vague orbit of this. Uh, one is the, there's this uh, group around Liat Kozma at the Hebrew University, and, and, then they, and they study uh, the history of African students in Israel. Uh, which you know is probably mostly unrelated, uh, and 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 the other literature I've I've come across is a, is a few people in urban history who've looked at uh, Israeli influence in urban planning, and Israeli developers in the sense of building companies, <laughs> in in Africa, uh, and and what both uh, Liad Kuzma and these and these people who work on. Uh, Israeli urban planning in Africa um, make very strongly as a point is is the extent to which Israel positions itself as a post-colonial country itself, which is a possibility that they have to some extent, right? And, I, and in the case of urban planning, I'm not I'm not sure if if it has to do with the specific issues of urban planning, right? So there, it's especially uh, possible to say, all right, so we Israelis. We we have experience in building stuff from scratch. Um, let's let's do and and the Europeans can't do that because you know that. Uh, so 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 it might be specific to to the field in which they they operate. Uh, but I was nonetheless struck that this this seemed to be a common theme, in in these two completely separate uh, literatures. All right. I'll leave it here and. Is there no one else? The because I, uh, I can, I, I'm not here to talk. I'm here to to hear everyone else. But if that is that for the moment, I would like to refer to a few of the points. I wrote everything down, and I hope I'll get the recording of this so I can uh, see if I missed anything um, um, about the diplomacy historiography. Thank you very much. I'll look into that. I really. I'm still, this is like a early days frozen picture of, of movement. So that will help me to, to develop um, um, some of these themes. Um, the question, are the wives experts themselves, is I suspect yes. I've been talking to other researchers who've been working on similar, uh, uh, similar subjects and they tell me Yes, and the question is, how exactly do I reveal that? Because the sources are obviously talking about them as the sources that I've seen, mostly the foreign ministry sources, they talk of them as, as housewives. And I think as in other researches that, that I've found this kind of dynamic, it hides way more than it actually reveals about what actually um, um, women were, were doing there. Um, so, at any rate, the work of, of the expert's wife is very much tied into the, the package, and you can see that they select families based on both partners' uh, capacity to do development work, but she is called the expert's wife and he is called the expert, which is, I mean, it's not surprising, but it's funny. Um, about... Um, Modernizing the family, uh, I think it was Jamil's uh, um, um, reference. I think in terms of Jewish law, um, it's an interesting point. And I think that um, it definitely is a kind of self-presentation that tries to say we are the modern family in a very kind of, I think, American panel of, of, of idea, of template of she's the housewife and he, he comes home and she cooks and, 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 and takes care of, of everything with the appliances. A lot of the bonuses that they receive is to buy all the latest appliances for their homes. 
so they can parade them in front of, of people. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure about Jewish law, but it's something I'd have to look into. These are people who pride themselves at being anti, uh, anti-religious. Uh, so Israeli socialists were very, very ardently secular. So I, I'm not sure how much that plays into, but it, it is worth uh, uh, looking into. Um, there was one point of the re replicability of the Israeli model, and I think that's a very interesting point, and it is often depicted as, first we did it in Israel with the Mizrahim, and then we can do the same for you if you want. But I think that what I'm finding is that it actually happens in tandem. And the kind of ideas are developing at the same time out of that encounter that's happening both in Israel and, uh, and in, in other places, in Burma, in Africa, and South America. I just chose Africa for this specific paper. Um, so in a way, the social group that the paper focuses on are people who are called experts, but often they do not have the, the, the papers, the, the, they didn't go to school, uh, they just, they worked on a kibbutz, so they ostensibly know how things work and they can teach it. A lot of them were military advisors, which is even more of a gray zone in terms of what exactly you need to be called, to, to call yourself an expert. Um, and one such model is the Gadna Youth Brigades. Uh, which they touted very strongly in Africa, and there's been interesting work on this, which is basically a semi-militarized frontier settlement that they sold uh, uh, to newly established African uh, uh, governments as a way to, um, to make the youth productive and hold front, uh, frontier territories. Uh, um, and they, they basically did the same idea, they, they kind of copied the same idea that they were doing in Israel just there. And you can still see these places mostly abandoned, kind of like ghost, ghost uh, memories in all sorts of places in Africa, which is, I think is also very interesting. Um, about uh, Lydia's three paradigms, do we have time? No. It's very interesting. I will talk to you about this later. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, that was a very quick wrap up. Um, <laughs> All right, thanks so much.